But today, thank you for the saints of God that are here that came to worship you, Lord, in spirit and in truth. We pray, Lord, that you illuminate our hearts and our minds from your word today. We ask it all in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Well, I'm going to embark on a little series here. I've preached on this word before, but from time to time the Lord says, okay, the, you, you need to share that topic, that subject with the church again. I don't know about you, but once upon a time, Maggie made some steak and potatoes and she put some vegetables on the side with it, with a piece of bread on the side, and we had that for dinner and it was good. And then since then, I haven't stopped eating steak and potatoes with vegetables on the side, right? So just because somebody, well, I heard that subject once, doesn't mean that you understand that subject, right? right? When something is good, you have it regularly. Oh, let's eat it again. You go to your favorite. They say Italian food is probably the most popular food in America. Whenever I've heard surveys, that's what they say. Uh, which is your favorite food? Typical people pick Italian food the most. And a lot of uh, folks don't didn't go to an Italian restaurant and ate once and they never visited it again, right? They go regularly every so often because they like and, and they appreciate Italian uh, food. So concerning different subjects in the Bible, you need to hear it again and again. And the Lord, uh, our job is to, to find the, the mind of the Lord concerning what we are to speak on. Okay. Several years ago, I was going through the different books in the Bible. I mean, I don't know how many books. We went to verse by verse by verse. And I had one of the, uh, one of the people in the congregation come up and say, hey, pastor, do you think you could go, you, you, you know, I, I like that going through the books verse by verse, but could you start preaching again on just different topics? So I prayed about it, and it was, uh, okay, I, I, I think the Lord was in that, so I went to uh, preaching different topics, and we've been doing that, but don't be surprised if one of these days I go back to verse by verse by verse, yeah. okay? So we share as uh, we believe the Lord is leading us, as long as it's out of the Bible and subjects that are in the Bible that are biblical, that don't contradict the Bible, then that's good. I'm going to talk today about opposition, okay? Uh, and I just uh, make, made this title, Opposition is No Stranger. I was waiting to see if somebody's going to jump up and say, Amen! But nobody jumped up, so... Uh, everybody does recognize that opposition is no stranger. As my text, I want to go to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. And uh, we're going to use as a text verse 12. Okay. It's right after the book of James, which is right after the book of Hebrews. 1 Peter 4. Uh, I'm in verse 1. I mean, I'm in chapter 1. That was good too, you know. But we're going to go to chapter 4, verse 12. And this is talking to the beloved. Who is the beloved of God? We are. You are. We are. His kids. The family of God. Those of us that he's redeemed through the blood of Jesus. Those of us he has adopted. Do you know that you have been adopted into yes. the family of God? And the book of Romans tells us that we, well, we can now cry out to God, say, Abba, Abba, that means Father, and He is our Father, because we're adopted into His family. So we're the beloved of God, He loves us. And here in Peter 4, verse 12, it says, Beloved, I say, yes, Father. He said, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you. A trial which is to try you. I guess he wants to emphasize that word try. Okay, Test you. He says, as though some strange thing happened to you. And the word strange there also means unusual. Unusual thing. So as I meditated on that passage, I couldn't help but to think of the life and ministry of the Apostle Paul. I was, I was wondering... What believer, because this is to the beloved, uh, so I'm, I'm thinking New Testament saints more so. Of course, uh, the Old Testament people that were covered, that were in faith, believing God, keeping the law according to what God wanted, they're also the beloved. But I'm, I'm concentrating here in the New Testament, and I think, of course, the best example of somebody who was 
who had opposition was the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul is credited with writing about half of the New Testament. Okay? That's a lot for one person. And God commissioned him and enabled him to write about half of the New Testament. You think Satan is not is just going to let that go? <laughs> Satan is going to oppose him probably more than anybody else because he's writing half of the New Testament. And he can't let that stand. He's going to challenge it. And anybody that, that uh, takes a stand... For God to do something for God get ready you're going to receive opposition so the Word of God is telling us here don't think it unusual don't think it's strange because you will receive opposition all right so I was talking about Paul here from the scriptures we're able to see the many trials he endured okay the many trials he endured because of what God had called him to do so it's quite obvious, I think, it, at least to me, that Paul suffered great, great opposition. Let me give you some examples. And some of them you'll be able to relate to. Some of them you won't be able to relate to. Paul was criticized. Has anybody ever criticized you? Just Josh. In, in the past, we've been yeah. criticized. Me too. Oh, Sean, you've been criticized. <laughs> you know who gets criticized? Th th there's a position in the church that can get a lot of credit and can get a lot of criticism. Anybody, you're looking at the position here. <laughs> Preachers can get, we can get, uh, we can get congratulated, and uh, we can get criticized both. And if you're a preacher that is affected by either of the two, you need to grow up. Okay. Preachers should not be, uh, we, we, we of course we're people and we want to be appreciated. Okay, it's important. But we can't let that affect us. Just like criticism. Uh, preachers get criticized a lot too. For a lot of different reasons, from a lot of different sources. But you can't let that get to you either. You, you, you study God's word, you pray, you do your, the best that you can to live for the Lord. And if you're a preacher, you're not any holier than anybody else, okay? We're the sheep of his pasture. The Lord just picks out a sheep. Uh, okay, you're the, you're the pastor. You're going to pastor those other sheep for me and I'll help you, okay? So uh, you're going to be criticized by the other sheep sometimes. And... Uh, one of the best, one, one of the worst things in the church is people. <laughs> and one of the best things in the church is people. Amen? So, well, the first thing God puts in your heart when you're saved is love for His people. You can't minister to God's people if you don't love the people. Right? You can't. It's impossible. I've seen people try it. And you, and you can tell. You ever been to a doctor that doesn't have the right bedside manner? You know, you're thinking, you know, I have nothing against mechanics. I need them every now and then. But he, he should, this guy should have been a mechanic. He should have been a, per, a people mechanic. You know, they just don't have the bedside manner. And then other doctors treat you with the love and the care. You can just see their calling. So you have to love people. So the first thing Paul uh, received, the opposition he received, was uh, criticism. Also, he was falsely accused. That one hurts when you've been credited with something that you never did. Yeah. Usually something on the negative side. Once in a while, somebody will give you credit for something you never did that was good. You say, oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But usually falsely accused. Paul's character was brought into question. That hurts when you have pure motives for God yeah, and, and somebody will... will will attack you and attack your character. I think of some of the people that run for office, uh, especially the, the Supreme Court justices. I mean, don't run for the United States Supreme Court because they'll, they'll drag you through the mud. And if there's no mud to drag you through, they'll invent some mud so they can drag you through it and, and they'll attack your character. Paul experienced a lot of that. He was robbed. He was beaten with fists, rods. 
hands, who knows what else that the Bible doesn't even tell us about. He was imprisoned. An innocent man. He was imprisoned mostly because he was preaching and teaching God's word. And under the Roman government, oftentimes it would be against the law, depending what province of the Roman government. Some enforced it more than others. But it was against the law to preach God's word. So he was a lawbreaker, but he, the, God's law supersedes every other law, right? It does. So he decided, I'm going to do God's will. And he was imprisoned and suffered many things in prison. And he was even stoned, and many scholars believe that he was stoned to death. If you read the book of Acts, I think you, you'll come to the conclusion, if you put that with what he said to the Corinthian church, that he probably was stoned to death. I mean, he endured a lot, more than any other believer than I know anything about. He endured a lot because of his testimony and his work for the Lord Jesus Christ. And he never said, I'm going to quit. He never said, this is too much. He never said, I'm going to run away. If he said it, it's not recorded anywhere. Okay. He was faithful. God knew who he was picking. If you're saved today, if you're washed in the blood of Jesus, God knew who he was picking. Amen. God thinks the same thing of you, if you're in Christ, that he thought of Paul. Just that Paul had a great call in his life. So guess what comes with a great call in your life? Great opposition. All right? So I don't want, I want to make sure that you believers don't feel condemnation. You don't feel, well, I'm just lowly and that was the great apostle Paul. No, he was called to do great things. So the enemy saw it and the enemy began to oppose him with great things. But you... You, God, sees you the same way he saw him. Now, you and I have not suffered as greatly as the Apostle Paul in living for God. But we have suffered opposition. Can you put that one up, Susan? Maybe when you're asleep today, you'll see these words in your mind. Opposition. 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 See, in the user-friendly churches across America today, uh, many believers don't understand what opposition is. They, they, uh, let me be very fair in the, in the, in the way I share this, as fair as I can be. The, it was easy, an easy thing to come to Christ, okay, and opposition was never brought up. The only opposition they experienced was, uh, I don't know, I can't think of any. They didn't experience much. One of our, one of the biggest churches here in California, the pastor has said, uh, stopped in the middle of a message, early in the service, I guess after the music, I'm not sure when it was, but I've read it, uh, a quote where he said, uh, let's stop everything. Is there anybody here that is not saved, that is not born again, that has not received Jesus as their Lord and Savior? And being a mega church, a big church, some hands went up. So he says, let's, let, let's get done with that right now. He says, repeat this prayer after me. So he, he said a, a prayer of repentance and the people repeated, okay, now you're saved. Okay, now we're done with that. Let's get on with the service. So that, uh, just to repeat a prayer won't save anybody from anything. <laughs> I know they quote, they're, they're, they're paraphrasing Romans 10 verses 9 and 10, but those verses uh, are dealing with believing in your heart. It's about believing. And you can't believe until you've heard the gospel, until you heard the message of the cross. And you can't believe until the Holy Spirit convicts you. You know what the word convict is? I, I said it a number of times, I'll say it again. When you go, if you've done something wrong, you've robbed the bank, you whatever, you, you're, you, you're, you take it to court, and there's a, product, a, a prosecutor there opposing you, attacking you, and when it's all over, the judge says, you are convicted of this crime. In other words, you're guilty. That's what conviction is. You're guilty of this crime. The word convict. What does that mean? People are in prison because they've been convicted. They've been found guilty of a crime. 
So you have to realize that you're guilty of, of being a sinner. And God can't allow sin in his family. And God cannot allow sin in heaven. So he's provided a way for man who he loves to, to, to be forgiven of the sin, for the sin to be atoned for. He did it in Christ at Calvary's cross. And then he can allow you into heaven. So without that feeling that you're a convict, that you're guilty of sin, nobody can be saved. You have to realize I'm a sinner. <laughs> I deserve Amen. going to hell. Amen. I don't deserve going to heaven. All of a sudden, when you thought you were such a good person, well, I've never robbed, I'm not, I don't steal. There are a lot of really, really good, great people. But they're sinners. So you have to feel that conviction of the Spirit. And then when you say that prayer, you're saying it the right way. You're saying, God, forgive me. Forgive me. Forgive me for my sin. Not a sin here and a sin there.